All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the one o'clock lecture, or uh, as I like to call it, the time to get mellow as we digest our food. Uh, it's going to be a lecture on fiscal policy and economic reality. Uh, the two are not always the same, so we're going to try to uh, bring some economic reality to fiscal policy. It's actually going to be a nice uh, complement, I think, to what just came before with modern monetary theory and the discussion there. Um, to begin with, of course, we want to get into some, some definitions. What is fiscal policy? Fiscal policy is government economic policy related to the government budget. So uh, we could say from the government's perspective, it is the government's attempt to achieve certain economic goals uh, through spending and taxing. And therefore, in order to understand and assess uh, fiscal policy, we need to analyze the economics of both government spending and the financing of the government spending. Uh, we actually do have to worry about where the money comes from, it turns out. Um, and uh, there are different views uh, on uh, fiscal policy. Uh, this first one is from a, a New York Times column uh, written by uh, Paul Krugman. Um, and he, as he says there, it's politically fashionable to rant against government spending and demand fiscal responsibility. But right now, increased government spending is just what the doctor ordered, and concerns about the budget deficit should be put on hold. Right? And that's a standard sort of Keynesian, what I call paleo-Keynesian perspective of what to do in the midst of a, a recession or a serious recession, which the United States faced in 2008. Uh, a slightly different perspective is given to us by Ludwig von Mises in uh, his work Planning for Freedom and Other Essays, where he says the government and its chiefs do not have the powers of the mythical Santa Claus. They cannot spend except by taking out of the pockets of some people for the benefit of others. And uh, Mises just highlights the fact that whenever the government spends, those resources do have to come from somebody, be it monetary or other resources. And uh, it should come as no surprise that I think uh, if you have to uh, rate either one of these quotes, uh, the Mises quote is preferable. Uh, it's more truthful. Um, and uh, so Krugman, on the other hand, and others, uh, and, and the, monetary, uh, the modern monetary theorists, shall we say, in spades, uh, seem to have this view uh, that we can pursue monetary policy uh, as if uh, reality doesn't matter. Uh, I would say in some sense that uh, contemporary fiscal policy, standard modern fiscal policy, amounts to what uh, the uh, American historian Clarence Carson would call a flight from reality. Um, academics, uh, a number of academics tend to think that prosperity requires the government to ensure adequate aggregate demand so that uh, there's enough spending, total spending, uh, so businesses can sell all that they produce. And that will prevent this general glut of goods or a general overproduction. So we can maintain uh, consumption in the short run so that uh, everything will be running along smoothly. Um, an example of this would be Rexford Tugwell. Rexford Tugwell was part of FDR's brain trust. Uh, he was, uh, he was um, the, uh, the chief economic advisor of his day to FDR, and he wrote a book called The Battle for Democracy, in which he says, quote, our economic course has carried us from the era of economic development to an era which confronts us with the necessity for economic maintenance. In this period of maintenance, there is no scarcity of production. There is, in fact, a present capacity for more production that is consumable. For today and tomorrow, our problem is that of national economic maintenance for the public welfare by government intervention. So uh, 1935, what do we have? This, 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 this argument or this assertion that uh, the scarcity problem's been solved. There's no more scarcity. We don't, that's not the problem. The problem is we're producing so much, there's not enough demand. And so how are we going to solve that demand? Well, of course, if, if the invisible hand of the market can't satisfy uh, demand or can't uh, produce enough demand, we need the visible hand of the state to give us enough demand. Well, again, fast forward to 1998. Again, uh, my favorite contemporary Paleo-Keynesian, Paul Krugman, in his book, Return to Depression Economics, 
a return of depression economics. Really, it should have been titled Return of Keynesian Economics, but in 1998, the K word wasn't in fashion yet. Uh, that sort of happened in 2008 and, and beyond. But as he says in 1998, the world is lurching from crisis to crisis, all of them crucially involving the problem of generating sufficient demand. So much fiscal policy today is driven by this ideology that in order to keep the economy running smoothly, in order to enjoy sustainable economic progress, we need government spending to ensure adequate, sufficient aggregate demand, or as normal people would call it, total demand. <laughs> um, economists are great at making a market for themselves by creating words that sound uh, you know, more impressive than they actually are. Instead of total, we call it aggregate. In, 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 instead of the, the wage, we'll call it the wage unit, uh, as uh, Keynes did in general theory. But in any event, um, now, that is, th these two views uh, are relatively common amongst a large number of uh, modern academics, even economists. On the other hand, uh, besides modern macroeconomists, most people actually do understand and accept the existential fact of scarcity, that scarcity of production still matters, and scarcity of economic goods still is why economics and economizing exist. Um, scarcity simply means that there are not, in fact, enough goods to satisfy all of our ends. The reason we have to economize, as you've already seen, is that goods are scarce. And so we can't achieve all of our ends, and so we have to uh, rank our ends and use our scarce means to achieve some ends and leave other ends unfulfilled. So the reason we have economics at all is because scarcity is real. And there have been uh, political economists and economists that do recognize this fact. For instance, Jean-Baptiste Say, in his treatise on political economy, notes that, quote, taxation deprives the producer of a product which he would otherwise have the option of deriving a personal gratification from if consumed unproductively, or if turning to profit, he preferred to devote it to uh, an useful employment. So his point is, when the government taxes somebody, the government is taking away resources, taking away monetary resources, or, or if it's taxation in kind, actual goods, that they could use, as he puts it, um, for personal, uh, uh, personal gratification if consumed unproductively. He simply means if they consume it. If they consume it, they, th that means it, or if they would have spent those resources on consumption by taxing, they're not going to be as, able to consume as much as, as they would otherwise without the tax. So they don't get as... They won't have as much fo food, as much clothing, uh, as many creature comforts as they would without the tax. On the other hand, if they would have devoted those resources to some productive activity, well, you're not going to get as much production either. Right? And so Say understood this. Right? Uh, so this, this view is, is um, the, 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 the tradition of a, of a more realistic understanding of the nature of taxation, nature of government spending, does go back a long way. Uh, here we have uh, Murray Rothbard in The Anatomy of the State, who says a robber who justified his theft by saying that he really helped his victims by his spending given a boost to retail trade would find few converts. But when the theory is clothed in Keynesian equations and in preference, uh, impressive references to the multiplier effect, it unfortunately carries more conviction. And so the assault on the common sense proceeds, each age performing the task in its own ways. Uh, you could probably just add to that, um, you know, the, the, uh, the rhetoric, uh, why are we borrowing money that we can create ourselves? Um, it, it, it just is another way to justify government large S. Um, what Rothbard and Say recognized is that when the government comes and decides to spend resources and then finances it through taxation or other means, it involves a taking, a taking of goods because of scarcity. And I would say even, even this is recognized even by that well-known, probably the most famous uh, student of the London uh, School of Economics, Mick Jagger, who uh, famously wrote, you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you just might find 
you get what you need. I mean, one of his most well-known songs is actually driven by the concept of the necessity of economization because things are scarce. You can't always get what you want. Right? Um, uh, Jagger, by the way, recognized that the most, at some point the most economical thing he could do is be, <laughs> drop out of school and become a rock star, and he was probably right. Um, there is, however, uh, there is uh, a, 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 a clip of uh, an episode of Saturday Night Live that he appeared on once, and they did this little sketch where he was supposedly on some talk show talking about um, the economy and the market economy, where he references Hayek in the midst of his discussion. It's quite, it's quite fascinating, but uh, that's just a, sort of an aside. So uh, there are these two main competing views, right? There's the, the view that we have to have government spending and, 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 and have fiscal policy uh, promoting uh, uh, increasing aggregate demand to maintain sufficient aggregate demand. And there's the other side that sort of recognizes that whenever government spends, that necessitates taking from somebody else. So at best, it seems to be a, a, a zero-sum game. Uh, now, to, to actually uh, give a full analysis of fiscal policy, as I said before, we need to be able to look at both government spending and uh, the, the effects of government spending and the effects of the different ways the government can finance that spending. So let's talk about government spending. Government spending is simply what it implies. The government, the US, in our case, the US Treasury, spends money on various things. And they can spend, they always spend money, of course, on specific things like uh, tanks and airplanes and aircraft carriers, or they spend money on subsidies by giving uh, subsidies to people with lower incomes. Sometimes they give subsidies to people with higher incomes, right? Uh, if you're the right kind of person that has a higher income, if you're the right kind of uh, corporation uh, that is doing uh, the government's bidding in a certain way, you can get some subsidies. Uh, there are art subsidies, humanities subsidies, green subsidies. Um, I don't know about you, I frankly, I like other colors, and I'm feeling like this this whole this whole uh, ide this whole ideology uh, promoting subsidies to green things sort of uh, you know is discriminatory against things like red colors like red and blue. Those are perfectly fine colors. Why not subsidize red industries and blue industries instead of just green? But again, I digress. Um, so what happens? What's the function? What's the economic function of government spending? Well, the number one thing that we all need to remember and keep in the forefront of our mind is that government spending per se, regardless of how it's financed, government spending per se causes a coercive shift of scarce resources and incomes from market producers to non-producers, from market producers to non-producers, or at the very least from the people that are most productive to people that are less productive. And we know this is the case because these are resources that are directed by government fiat, by the, the will of the government, the desire of the bureaucrat, as opposed to um, concerns related to profit and loss. We've already talked about the importance of economic calculation and, and, and the calculational chaos that uh, a government uh, finds itself in when decisions are made bureaucratically as opposed to uh, made uh, thinking about profit and loss economic calculation. So when the government spends money, the funds are directed by government fiat, and then the resources then are directed in the economy by government fiat. And so the state subsidies, and this is also important, the state subsidies create a distribution process separate from production. Right? In a free market, if you earn an income, you must supply a product or supply a productive service to somebody else. In, in a free market, uh, we have to live according to the dictum of um, uh, Bob Dylan, right? You gotta serve somebody. You, in order, if you wanna generate an income, you have to serve somebody, you have to be productive. Right? And so your, your ability to earn income is, um, is predicated on your ability and willingness to be productive by satisfying some need. But when government spending comes into play, when the government subsidizes certain activities, now people are able to earn an income without being productive. They get an income by, by qualifying for the grant. Right? And they don't have to do anything in return. Now, as we know, this then causes 
uh, creates a distribution process. Right? It's not just government redistribution. It's a dist this is the first distribution. Right? Because wealth and income in a free society, wealth and income is not, quote unquote, distributed. As if, you know, what does the word distribution sort of bring to mind? Right? Distribu distributing something means you have and you're passing it out. Right? It's like there's this, this VAT O income. And then people come by and with a little bowl and they, the, the, the little, uh, the, the income czar, you know, uh, uh, turns it on and a little bit of income falls out into each cup and everyone gets a little bit of income. And if you're a friend of the, if you're the friend of the income czar, you get a little bit a larger bowl maybe. And then, you know, if you're not, you're some, you're some poor waif, they get their little income and they consume it and they come back and say, excuse me, sir, can I have more? Right? And you go, you want more? You don't get more. Get out of the way, kid, you bother me, right? So that's, that's the sort of the, the idea that income is distributed. That's what sort of is brought to mind. That's not the way uh, income is earned in a free society. Income is not distributed. It is actually earned. Right? It's earned by supplying a good or a productive service. But with subsidies, you no longer have to do that. Right? So allocation of income is distorted away from the efficient service of other people in society. And in, in, a, in, a, in a business context, state subsidies will tend to prolong the life of inefficient firms at the expense of efficient ones. Right? Because these subsidies will hamper the flow of income and the flow of factors of production to uses uh, that are more in demand of consumers. Right? So in the free society, income and resources will tend to flow to those people that are being most productive and most um, uh, successful at satisfying pe other people in society. State subsidies hampers or hinders that process. So for instance, if we have a situation here, let's suppose we have two uh, potential producers, two industries, and one is the FCC, the flourless chocolate cake industry. Right? That's not the Federal Communications Commission. That's a different FCC altogether. Not nearly as delicious. Um, uh, so yeah, the flourless chocolate cake industry, say, earns a 6% rate of return, and in, 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 um, in fishing, in fishing you earn a 4% a rate of return. Now, if that's the case, there's going to be entrepreneurs that, if, as they recognize this, are going to direct resources into flourless chocolate cake production because that is uh, the industry where the value of the product is greater relative to the value of the factors of production compared to fishing at this particular moment, right? And so it, it, you, you look at the, the net revenue. Um, and you, uh, the net revenue is equal to total revenue minus the initial investment. And let's suppose that um, in, in, in fishing, there's $2 million uh, invested in some fishing venture, and it turns a, uh, a revenue of $2,080,000. Uh, $2, so net revenue is $80,000. is 4%, 4% rate of return. And you know that's, that's, it is what it is. Right? Now let's suppose, for some reason, somehow, the government says, you know what? Um, these fishermen need to be supported. Right? Or, or, you know, we need to just spend money somehow and uh, money gets directed uh, to, um, to the fishermen. Now, this, the government subsidies are treated like revenue. Right? If I am a business and I, get some, I, I can get revenue from selling my fish and then I get a check in the mail, that's just added to my revenue. So it's a type of revenue. Right? So then we can look at and compare the situation without, in a free market with, with subsidies. And if you look at the net revenue with the subsidy, you have the sales that you get, the $2,000, $80,000, plus, let's say, a $60,000 $60, subsidy right, that you can apply through, say, maybe through the, I don't know, the Department of Commerce or what have you. And so you get $60,000. You sum it all up. You add the $2,080,000 uh, plus the $60,000. And then you subtract from that your net investment of two, or, I'm sorry, $2 million. And what do you have left? You have a net revenue of $140,000, which is now 7%. Right? The rate of return is larger. In fact, the rate of return is larger than the rate of return in the flourless chocolate cake industry. Now, two questions there. What, does that, what, what incentives does that put in place for an investor? Now, where does it look like the hot, profitable investment is going to be? Flourless chocolate cake production or... Fishing production. It's fishing. Right? Fishing, that's where the money is. Show me the money. That's where the money is. Right? 
Now the question, the second question is asked, why? Why all of a sudden did the rate of return in fishing increase? Is it because there was a significant increase in the demand for fish relative to flour with chocolate cake? Nay, nay. No, it's not. This, this apparent, or this increase in rate of return is not due to an actual increase in relative demand by people in society. It's due to the government subsidy. And so resources then will get directed out of the flourless chocolate cake industry into the fishing industry. And it's not just those industries that are affected. It's not just, you know, it's not just the bakers and the fishermen that are affected, right? All of the connecting industries are going to be con are affected too, right? And so resources will be directed out of, investment will be directed out of the flourless chocolate cake industry. So there will be a decrease in the demand for semi-sweet chocolate, for butter and eggs, and then there will be a, a, a marginal decrease in the demand for, say, cocoa beans, and the demand for cream, and the demand for chickens. At the same time, there will be an, an increase in demand for uh, fishing boats, and fishing nets, and, uh, and, and coolers, and ice that are required to keep the, the, the fish you know, uh, uh, fresh enough to get it back to, uh, to the market. Right? And so resources are directed and allocated according to rates of return. But in this case, with government subsidies, the rates of return do not reflect the voluntary preferences of society. And so resources get directed away from um, the uh, lines of production dictated by the voluntary preferences of society to those lines of production that uh, have high rates of return simply by receiving government privilege. And so government subsidies cause a coercive si a shift of scarce resources and incomes from market producers to non-producers because it produces, it places government bureaucrats in the command of scarce resources. And, and really, if you, if you listen carefully to the discussion uh, at the previous, the previous lecture about modern monetary theory, that's what it really boils down to. Uh, modern monetary theory boils down to using, uh, shall we say, uh, smoke and mirrors to justify and to, um, in some sense, not even justify, but to confuse the public so they can get away with having bureaucratic command of resources. So, so we can have, ha so, so the state can use the resources as they see fit. Um, resources, uh, by, in some sense, almost by definition, by the government are consumed rather than invested according to preferences in people's society. If you have a certain amount of income, you, you have a salary, say, of $100,000, and you decided you want to spend, I don't know, 50% 50, 50 of that on, on, on food right? and clothing, that's what you do. You spend it on food and clothing, you are consuming. You are spending it on consumption because you're the ones that are dictating how you're going to spend that money. Right? And you're spending it on consumer goods. You're, you're spending it on things that gives you direct satisfaction. Similarly, when the bureaucrats oversee the spending of money, they are engaging in consumption because they are spending on what they want to use it for. They're spending on what it gives them satisfaction. So resources are consumed rather than invested according to preferences of people in society. And not only are they consumed, but they are consumed inefficiently. Uh, when we spend our money on consumption, we know what we want. We know what, what, what gives us satisfaction, what we think gives us satisfaction. And, and if we're trying something new and it doesn't give us satisfaction, well, okay, forget that. Um, we'll, we'll spend it on something else that we know will give us satisfaction. Well, the government, of course, the government, um, when they spend money, as already said, their spending is not dictated by calculation of any sort uh, in terms of economic profit and loss. And so the resources are consumed. Uh, even when they engage in things that maybe look like investment, like infrastructure, those spending, those uh, goods are never produced as efficiently as the private sector could produce them uh, because they are produced not because of economic calculation. And so uh, resources then are 
uh, consumed. They are kept from being directed in the most uh, productive, uh, profitable way, according to the market uh, division of labor. And that's the, the last thing. It, 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 it constrains and hampers and distorts, government spending does, hampers and distorts the market division of labor. So factors are directed away from their comparative advantage, and if and, and if and if and if they're directed away from the comparative advantage, what does that mean for productivity in general? Are we more or less productive as people find it not as easy to uh, produce according to their comparative advantage? Yeah, they're less productive. They're less productive, and so uh, each person that is not able to Produce according to natural, uh, natural comparative advantage will be less productive. Society in general will be less productive, which means we are relatively impoverished. Right? Those are the general consequences, the economic consequences of government spending. Certainly, there are certain people that will benefit, but in general, the society as a whole will be harmed because of the uh, constraining of the market division of labor and the uh, capital consumption that occurs when government spends uh, our money and our resources. So that's on the government spending side. And I must say this too, by the way, all of these consequences are unrelated to how government finances this spending. In other words, the, the, the resources are consumed no matter how the goods are uh, the, the spending is financed. And, by the way, government spending consumes resources even if we run a balanced budget. Right? And so uh, these uh, effects of government spending are immediate. They're immediate and they're, they are real. But to fully understand the economic consequences of the government budget, both taxing and spending, we now have to turn our attention to how does the government finance how do they actually pay for it? And how they pay for it actually does matter, it turns out. And as was mentioned last time uh, in the previous lecture, a government spending can be financed in only three ways, either by taxes, by borrowing, or inflation. And all three have negative economic consequences. All three have negative economic consequences. Uh, first, we're going to look at is taxation. What are, the, what are the economic consequences of taxation? Well, taxation results in capital consumption, which if you remember from the lectures on capital theory, also makes us less productive because capital consumption um, uh, implies we have fewer tools and machines with which to work, so our productivity falls, or it could imply that the, the goods that we have aren't as useful in satisfying preferences anymore in which their value drops as well. And, and, and taxation, consumes capital, and therefore discourages economic or productive activity. How so? Well, in the first place, higher taxes reduce the incentive for laborers to work and for landowners to rent land for productive uses, right? because one of the great incentives of you know, going to work is to earn a salary. And if the wage is lower, if the salary is lower, that work is less attractive. Right? And if in a free society, you're able to work without taxes, and the government then imposes a tax so that 20% of your income from some employment is now taxed away. Your salary is, in effect, decreasing by 20%. Not as attractive. Not as attractive. Same thing goes for landowners. If, if you're, you're renting your land for a certain amount of money, and then the government takes 20% of that, that lowers the revenue that you're going to get from renting land effectively by 20%. And at some point, there can be some landowners say, you know what, uh, it's not worth going through the hassle of any land. I'll just keep the, I'll just use the land myself. Right? I'll just let it, I'll just let it, uh, just let it be free, right? and let nature take its course. And so, um, higher taxes reduce the incentive of laborers to work for landowners to rent land for productive purposes. Uh, additionally, taxes reduce the ability of people to save and invest. They reduce the ability of people to save and invest. And what do we mean by that? Well, again, if I am a person, I may be inclined to save, and I, uh, say, have a, a salary of $100,000, 
and I say was going to um, uh, say consume, spent, spent about 75% of that on consumption and 25% of that on uh, saving investment. I'm going to save 25% of my income. I am uh, spending $75,000 on consumption and $25,000 on investment. And either I'm investing things directly or I may be depositing in a, in a CD and the bank's using that to loan out. But anyway, there's $25,000 that goes into investment. Right? Now let's suppose I get that same salary, but the government imposes a $20,000 uh, a, a, a $20, tax on me. So now my disposable income is only $80,000. But if my time preference hasn't changed, I'm now going to spend $60,000 on consumption and only $20,000 on saving investment. And so my ability to save and invest decreases because of my tax bill. Right? So taxation reduces the ability of people to save and invest. Additionally, however, taxes reduce the incentive of people to save and invest. Because taxes reduce the returns from, people, uh, from productive investment. So if I'm, again, if I'm getting a, uh, expecting to get a 10% return on my money, the tax is now considered, it, it, without taxes, I'm getting a 10% rate of return. And if my time preference uh, finds that suitable, I engage in, if, if let's suppose my time preference is such that um, I require at least an 8% rate of return to make this investment. And here's a 10% rate of return I can get. I'm, I'm making an economic profit as far as I'm concerned. That's a good thing. Right? So I make that investment. But now let's suppose that the government now imposes a tax so that in order for me to do business, I have to fork over a certain percentage of my income. And, and so that tax, from the business's perspective, is treated as a cost. So a government tax increases the cost of production. So instead of having, say, a 10% rate of return, if the taxes are high enough, maybe the rate of return comes in at 7%. The, 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 the revenue, the tax that they take is, is enough so my rate of return is 7%. My time preference demands an 8% rate of return. What happens to my decision to save and invest in a productive activity? It goes away. It's, it's gone with the taxes. right? Gone with the taxes. And so taxation reduces the ability of people to save and invest. It also reduces the incentive to save and invest. So if the ability of people to save and invest is decreased by taxes, and their incentive to save and invest is decreased by taxes, what happens to the magnitude of saving and investment? It decreases, right? There's not as much saving and investment. Right? So over time, what happens to the uh, capital structure? The capital structure shrinks. Right? It, 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 it shortens. Uh, people, the the ca total capital stock decreases. And so because per capita capital decreases, again, people are not as productive, our productivity declines, eco economy-wide output declines, real wealth falls, people see a drop in their standard of living. This is hardly the way to expand the economy right? through taxation. The bottom line is that Government spending and taxation tends to increase consumption and decrease saving and investment. State spends on consumption. They take money out of relatively low time preference people and give it to relatively high time preference people. Uh, funding, we could say funding uh, increased government spending by increased taxation is like pouring weed killer on your garden all the time thinking it's miracle grow. It's just, it's, it's not going to work. Right? It's not going to work. Now, as we know, taxes are politically very unpopular, as was mentioned in the previous lecture. And so governments often resort to deficit spending. Right? Governments do not like to tax uh, people enough to fund all of their government spending. We haven't done that in, in decades. Right? And so uh, what do we do? We engage in deficit spending. Deficit spending, by definition, is when the government spends more money than it brings in in tax revenue. That's what deficit spending is, uh, when the, the government spends more money than it brings in through tax revenue. And if they do that, they can fund the deficit in two different ways. Right? One of the ways is monetary inflation. They, can, uh, they or their agents uh, can increase the money supply. 
uh, kings of times past simply uh, engage in monetary debasement. Right? Uh, they would have, say, an ounce silver coin, and then let's make it a 90% silver coin. And then let's make it a 50% silver coin. And then let's make it a, I don't know, let's make it a steel coin with a silver wash. Maybe a bronze coin with a silver wash. It looks like the real thing. I know. Let's have, a, let's have a base metal coin, and we'll put a little golden veneer on it. And we could call it, uh, we could call it the Sacagawea dollar. Right? We could call it that. Um, and, and then see if people would use it. Um, no, but the, the, the kings in times past would engage in, just in, in monetary debasement that way. And by doing that, you could get more monetary units per actual monetary metal. Uh, now, of course, that seems to be you know, a little bit um, which is uncool. So we could do the same thing with simply modern monetary theory. <laughs> right? We could just, we could just uh, you know, we're like the old uh, uh, Frito-Lay ad or the old uh, Doritos ad. You know, we'll, we'll, uh, spend all you want, we'll make more. Right? That's kind of the attitude. And um, so you can you uh, engage in monetary inflation that way. Um, the first thing we have to understand then is, okay, what's going to happen in that case, right? The modern monetary theory is we're going to do all these great things, right? We can do all these great things through just creating more money. But it's important for us to understand, and they, again, uh, based on the lecture last time we see, they, they sort of halfway acknowledge this. But increased government spending, or I'm sorry, increasing the money supply, increasing the number of dollars, the monetary units, does not increase the quantity of land, or the quantity of labor, or the quantity of capital goods that we can use to produce products. So monetary inflation does not increase factors of production at all. You can't just, you know, the, 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 chair, the Jerome Powell can't just click his heels and say there's no, there's no place like, there's no place like uh, factors of production, there's no place like factors of production, and have them just spontaneously, you know, shazam, and, 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 and here we are. Right? Monetary inflation can't do that. What that means is monetary inflation also cannot just magically increase the quantity of consumer goods. And so what monetary inflation does is creates more monetary units, right? more dollars in our case, but not more goods. When people get more dollars, though, what's going to be true about the marginal utility of dollars that they're holding? It decreases, right? So the value of the marginal dollar is going to fall relative to whatever goods that they could purchase that will stimulate demand for these goods. right? People will buy, want to buy more, and they'll try, to, they'll try to buy more food and more clothing, more shelter, more you know, smarty phones and whatnot. And so what's going to happen to the price of these things? Right? People demand more food, clothing, and shelter, but the quantity of food, clothing, and shelter supplied is not going to increase. So the price of these things must go up. The price of these things must go up. So monetary inflation will result in higher prices results in higher prices, what happens to the purchasing power of money? It decreases, right? So as you've already seen, an increase in the stock of money increases prices. So we all might have more money, but we have to pay higher prices. So there is no general social benefit through monetary inflation. We don't have, there, is no, there is no consequence of inflation that benefits the entire society. There is no general social benefit. Overall prices go up, the purchasing power of money falls. Right? Now, there are particular people, of course, that benefit from monetary inflation. Right? The people who get the new money first benefit at the expense of those people who get it late or not at all, right? through, the, through the Cantillon effects that you've heard uh, spoken of. Right? And so there, there, are, there are some people that benefit. I mean, that's, that's why they do it. <laughs> some people do benefit, but they benefit at the expense of other people, i.e., right? the rest of society. So monetary inflation uh, and funding government spending through monetary inflation uh, will, not, uh, will not help us. Um, now, if you don't want to just create money and new money and spend it, a la modern monetary theorists, we can borrow money. And you can borrow money from two different places. right? You can borrow money from the banking system. And that is essentially inflationary also. That's just another form of inflation because um, uh, banks will will, 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 can create money out of thin air. 
uh, as they get new reserves injected into them by the uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, banks will tend to lend newly created dollars, resulting in an increase in the money supply and all of its associated negative consequences we just talked about. Additionally, what do we know happens when there is artificial credit expansion? That when we, 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 create, we create loans not funded by voluntary savings, what does that generate? The business cycle, right? It generates a business cycle. Uh, business activity expands when the people get the new money first, the entrepreneurs get the new money first, and they want to inject it into, and they want to expand their, their, their businesses. Uh, they want to maybe buy new businesses, or they want to expand their plants, or buy another facility. They, they expand their operations, um, and that maybe looks good for a while because they have to bid, bid labor and other resources away from other uses, so wage rates go up, happy days appear to be here again. But, uh, and, and so we have this inflationary boom. And, uh, but but bad, bad investments are not made economically sound uh, just because there's more money in existence. Right? And these bad investments must eventually be liquidated, as you've already learned through your lectures on the business cycle. And so the boom resolves itself in a bust, whose twin offspring are capital consumption and unemployment. And it turns out that monetary inflation also is not a way to sustainably generate economic prosperity. Uh, neither if we just inflate money out of thin air, but the, you know, the, the, government, the Treasury somehow would do that, or if we rely on the banking system to do it for us. Right? Uh, the other way to fund, besides inflation taxes, is borrowing, right? government debt. We can borrow from the non-bank public, from private citizens. Now, uh, borrowing, if, 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 if a government deficit was funded completely by uh, borrowing from the non-bank public, that would mean that there, was, that, that there is no new money being created, so that would not be inflationary. Right? But it still has serious negative economic consequences. Right? Uh, government borrowing, uh, just like government spending, diverts savings from private investment to government consumption. Right? Um, some savings, and this is, this is crucial, some savings that would have been invested in productive activities by entrepreneurs will instead be spent on whatever government officials desire. Right? And a good example of this is um, the clean hydrogen subsidies. Uh, clean hydrogen subsidies that um, the current administration has been promoting. Uh, back in October of last year, uh, the current administration announced $7 billion in subsidies to create seven regional clean hydrogen hubs. And in addition, uh, under the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act, green hydrogen, which is hydrogen manufactured with no carbon emissions, that's what makes it green, uh, will be eligible for a production tax credit of up to $3 per kilogram produced. And they're doing this, they say, because they want to reduce, um, they want to reduce uh, carbon emissions by producing more so-called clean hydrogen. The problem is there is more energy required to manufacture hydrogen than the hydrogen contains. So the billions of dollars that is being spent to produce clean hydrogen will never, if, you're, if we're going to spend, say, $10 billion, we're not going to get $10 billion back, right? The government is consuming resources. And this government consumption, again, reduces the economy stock of capital, reducing the productivity of the labor force and the general standard of living. At the same time, government borrowing competes with private demand for investable resources. Government borrowing will thereby increase uh, demand uh, for loanable funds, raising interest rates. The rate of interest entrepreneurs must pay to borrow funds from capitalists uh, will be higher than it is otherwise. So even private, private entrepreneurs that, that, that must borrow voluntary savings will find it harder to do so. And we could also say, I think, that government borrowing has an even greater impact on saving investment than taxation. So why? How, how could that be? Well, think about it. If, if the government funds its spending through taxation, some of that tax money would have been spent on consumption. Not all of that tax money would have been spent on saving investment. Right? So saving investment would decrease, but so would consumption. If, on the other hand, every dollar that the government spends 
beyond taxation is funded by borrowing from the non-bank public, every dollar of that debt comes from net savings. Right? So uh, the, the, the amount of money that government borrows from the non-bank public dollar for dollar takes savings out of the hands of entrepreneurs and puts in the hands of the bureaucrat. Whereas taxes are not that not as egregious. It was still ha you know, you're still taking money from the citizens. It's reducing the welfare of the citizens, but in different ways. In different ways. And um, the bottom line is that production and overall living standards are further diminished regardless of how government spending is funded. Uh, the very existence of government spending uh, causes distortions in the market division of labor uh, and uh, private investment and the stock of capital that are uh, generally negative and therefore, uh, contrary to the wishes uh, of uh, Krugman and the modern monetary theorists, um, uh, there is no general social benefit from government spending regardless of how it is financed. All right, thank you very much.